1661, Beijing. The young emperor of the Qing dynasty, Xunzhi, began to have a rash, fever, and ache in muscles. He was ill. Three days after he felt something was not right, he died at the age of 21. The newly established empire needed a new emperor. Xunzhi's third son, although disfigured and young, was chosen to inherit the throne. One of the most important reasons why Xunzhi picked him was because the disfigured son was once infected with the same disease, yet survived. In that case, even though the disease disfigured him, he would not be infected again by the same fatal pathogen, which had no cure at that time. And that is smallpox, a tiny bit of genetic material, to be precise, a single kind of nucleic acid. And a code made of protein molecules could even decide the higher of an empire. Viruses, which cannot even be referred to as living creatures, have thoroughly changed human history. The history of human is more or less the history of human beings suffering from and fighting back against viruses. Thousands of years ago, we fought against smallpox. Now, we are fighting against coronavirus. Things have changed. However. Even with the development of medical science, in front of viruses, humans are still helpless in a way. Nothing seems to have changed. The origin of viruses cannot be tracked because they do not leave any fossils to be studied. There is much debate about where viruses came from, and scientists have not agreed on whether they are descendants of some free-living organisms. Or they arose from cells, or they appeared even earlier than cells. The earliest evidence of virus can be traced back to perhaps 300 million years ago in insects. While its appearance in human society may not be that early, it still affected one of the earliest human civilizations. When mummified remains of Ramses V. The fourth pharaoh of the 20th dynasty of Egypt was discovered in 1898. His face and neck displayed a striking rash of pustules strongly resembling smallpox, and Ramses V died in 1157 BC. Ever since then, viruses have appeared and disappeared, and whenever they appear, they have brought perhaps disasters and changed human society. Take a look at the long list of viruses human beings have been fighting for, and you would understand how significantly they have shaped our society and history. In 430 BC, a plague, which is believed to be related to measles viruses, hit Athens and killed 20% to 25% of the population in the city. It almost devastated Athens' army and might contribute to Peloponnesian League's victory over Athens. The yellow fever forced the U.S. government to shut down itself and quarantine the capital city, Philadelphia, in 1793. It also stopped European explorers and colonists from entering the heartland of Africa. Consequently, they turned to America and brought smallpox there, wiping out almost all local populations of Indians. In Europe, in the 17th and 18th century, before vaccines were made, smallpox killed 400,000 people a year. Even until modern time in 1952, the poliomyelitis virus has infected 58,000, paralyzed 21,000, and killed over 3,000 people in the U.S. Again and again, human beings were slaughtered by viruses in history. People died, emperors infected, and empires fell. Yet again and again, humans could barely fight back. Before scientists invented the electron microscope, people could not even see viruses. Literally, for quite a long time, they did not know what hit them. Back then, people mainly relied on previous experience and the immune system to survive. For instance, for one of the deadliest viruses in history, smallpox, people had limited ways to save lives before vaccines were made. As a dangerous prevention, variolation, the transfer of smallpox as an inoculum into susceptible individuals is believed to have occurred in China as early as the first century. Recorded description of such cure can be found in archives from Song Dynasty in the 10th century. 
It consists of obtaining dried smallpox gaps, converting them into a powder, and inhaling the substance through the nose. But since the powder was directly taken from infected people, viruses were still very active compared with the ones in nowadays vaccines. As a result, there was a 2% death rate after variolation. Nevertheless, that was still a prevention for smallpox, which would initially kill around 30% of the infected. Quarantine is also another method that people have used against viruses. The institutionalized practice of quarantine presumably began in 1348, first in the Venetian Republic. The city council was allowed to detain ships, cargoes, and individuals in the Venetian lagoon for up to 40 days in the midst of a plague. Unfortunately, such measure proved to be only modestly effective. People were still in urgent need of more effective ways. And we took the chance. After centuries of exploring in the darkness, people finally saw some morning light in the late 18th century. In 1796, Dr. Edward Jenner used scraps from cowpox to inoculate an eight-year-old boy. While later, the boy was injected with variolous material, he did not show any symptoms of getting infected. The first successful vaccination throughout history was invented, and it blew the horn of counterattack Although, at that time, nobody knew how vaccination actually worked. In 1884, Charles Chamberlain invented Password Chamberlain Filter, which can be used to filter bacteria from the liquid. Fifteen years later, Dmitry Losovich Ivanovsky in Russia and Martinez Bergerink in Netherlands demonstrated that the material responsible for a disease of tobacco plants passed through the pores of a Password Chamberlain Filter with a losing effectivity. Moreover, these substances could not grow no media that is used to culture bacteria. Their result was the first report of a plant virus, the tobacco mosaic virus. Viruses henceforth got their names. This fighting paved the way for people to learn about the essence of viruses. During the next half of a century, scientists made more breakthroughs in the study of viruses, as measles, yellow fever, influenza, and poliomyelitis continue taking turns to break out worldwide. In 1899, people successfully stopped the spread of yellow fever viruses at the construction site of the Padma Canal by eradicating mosquitoes. Another huge step forward was taken in 1931, while German engineer Ernest Ruska and Max Noll invented an electron microscope. For the first time, it was possible for people to see what a virus looks like. In the same year, American pathologist Ernest Goodpasture managed to culture influenza viruses in chicken and braille. Before his work, previous methods to culture viruses in living tissues was expensive, hard to control, and easily contaminated by bacteria. Goodpasture's method later became the foundation of mass production of a wide range of vaccines against viruses. Ever since then, human beings began to take over. Vaccines for yellow fever were developed in 1937, influenza in 1945, polio vaccines in 1955, measles vaccines in 1963, rubella vaccines in 1969. In short, most of the fatal viruses in the past few centuries can be prevented after the 1950s. People even managed to eliminate smallpox in 1980 and are aiming to eradicate viruses like the yellow fever. In the 1960s, the notion of developing a drug that can be used to kill or inhibit viruses rather than training the immune system was raised. The general idea behind such drugs is to identify viral proteins or parts of the proteins that can be disabled. For the past 50 years, between 1963 and 2016, 90 antiviral drugs were proved to treat 9 infectious diseases. Oh, but the process has been extremely hard and slow as these drugs have to be 100% effective in eliminating viruses. Otherwise, viruses would again start to replicate themselves and may even gain drug resistance. Meanwhile, with massive breakthroughs in vaccines and antiviral drugs since the 1950s, new viruses also kept emerging as people began to explore and invade more wildland that was once animals' habitats, especially in Africa and air travel became more prevailed. Consequently, viruses once hid in animals' bodies were released. 
they mutated and began to infect human beings, spreading from Africa to other continents. Calling them hemorrhagic fever and human immunodeficiency viruses may sound unfamiliar, yet they indeed have repeatedly become headlines in the news in recent years with other names. Healthcare workers are throwing everything they have at Ebola. Doctor came in and he jokingly said, "Yeah, we're even going to test him for West Nile." Thirty-six and counting. That's how many years have passed since AIDS first caught the attention of public health officials. These new pathogens. Especially like the Ebola viruses, have even higher death rate than previous human killers like smallpox. They suddenly broke out and they left silently, only leaving dead bodies behind. None of the medical researchers know where and how people got infected. The only way to mitigate the situation is to quarantine people infected. We are once again in the same dilemma. Barely do we have vaccines or drugs to treat the diseases. Just like how helpless people were when the plague broke out in Athens 1,600 years ago.